We just want you to all feel welcome today. Um, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and uh, if you think of something, write it down and uh, hopefully you'll have, some, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions uh, when our speaker is, is done. So I want to welcome New Jerusalem House of Prayer, Wheaton Christian Center. Let our family know. We have a new family uh, that we've been introduced to, New Jerusalem House of Prayer, and now we're forever connected. And uh, we thank God uh, for Pastor Cope bringing his congregation so that we all can mingle and rub shoulders together. And it's good, it's pleasant, it's wonderful. And the Lord commands a blessing in an atmosphere like this. Also, we have uh, our SWAT is with us today. Our SWAT is our youth ministry students with a testimony. Give them a hand. All right. So this is great. I'm so glad that we are, uh, that you're allowing yourself to be educated so that uh, when you uh, see things going on, you'll have a biblical perspective of what you see happening in the world. And sometimes I, I see the topic here is anti, that we're going to, looks like we're going to discuss anti-Semitism. You're going to find out what that is uh, because sometimes we have so-called leaders in our community who say things uh, and you'll learn what anti-Semitism anti is. So uh, without further ado, we want to welcome uh, my friend, my personal Messianic rabbi and a uh, person who I, I go to for advice and counsel on whatever you know I'm dealing with as, as a pastor, very experienced, and uh, he has been in the business world. We heard about his testimony, how he was a vice president for Oracle, and I just looked up uh, Larry Ellis. I looked up his network. I was kind of nosy, and I, know, I noticed he's now at $53 billion. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> We, we praise God for the wealth of experience that we have uh, that we are receiving from our speaker, my friend, uh, Dr. Cope. Welcome again. Uh, this is Be At Home. We're so excited to receive. Amen. Well, the first thing I want to do is compliment these folks on making this table not squeak. <laughs> It was, I was afraid of it last week. Um, when we're done, I've brought 60 of these with me. I don't know if that's enough. I hope so. Uh, this is uh, a print of the draft chapter from the new book I'm working on, and this is on anti-Semitism. So what I'm going to share with you tonight will be sort of a superficial view of what's in here, so you'll get a little bit of it. Um, but then you'll be able to pick up a copy of this for free when we're done and go home and really indulge if you desire uh, to do so, and I hope you do. Um, I have to say something when we start, and I'm going to say this really seriously, and I mean it really seriously, uh, and I don't know any other way to put this other than this is going to be really unpleasant. And I'm not joking. Uh, I'm going to talk about some things which are just going to break your heart. And they're going to really hurt. Um, but without the realization of those things that I'm going to share, nothing will ever change. Right? I mean, that's the reality, particularly of living as a believer, uh, is you have to confront the evil in the world and very often the evil in the church if it's to be overcome. Uh, and you can just skate over it and ignore it, but that doesn't glorify God and it doesn't do any justice whatsoever to the sacrifice of Jesus. I mean, really. So I apologize in advance, but this is going to be dead serious. It's going to be really troublesome. I'm not going to say anything tonight that I don't believe is true and haven't seen the research about, um, but I suspect a lot of it uh, will be a surprise and a shock. Uh, this is about the Jews. 
They've been despised throughout history. And the primary reason they were despised throughout history across many generations in many countries over the course of millennia is because of their steadfast refusal to accept the gods of their conquerors. Now, not everyone lived up to that. But fundamentally, the tradition in the world for literally millennia was if the country you lived in had its local gods and you were invaded by another country, you typically accepted the gods of your conquerors because they had proven themselves more powerful than the gods you worshipped locally. That was, civilizations considered that self-evident. And the conquerors managed to control the people they had conquered by changing their culture and making it adopt to the culture of the conqueror. We'll make people like us, they'll be easier to control. The problem was the Israelites, the Jews, over the course of centuries, refused. Invasion after invasion, they refused to worship the gods of their conquerors. Some gave in and did, but there was always a core that didn't, and the result was that they were despised by their conquerors. And I'll give you some examples of that. By the way, this includes Jews being conquered by Christians, either by Christian um, military conquerors or Christian countries, or even just Christian governments that required the Jews in their population to convert or die. Now, I don't believe that Christian leaders who did that really deserve the label Christian. I think they use their position and that method to try to influence the population that was under them, and it just didn't work as well as they thought it would for the Jews. And so they got killed, or put in jail, or in some cases escaped to various parts of the world. Now, I want to be clear um, of two things. One, this is still going on. Well, all you have to do is open the newspaper or watch TV. It's still going on all over the planet. In fact, it's getting worse in some places. And it's done in local groups of people, either explicitly or implicitly. And this is actually very appropriate in an African-American or um, church where a large part of the membership is of color. Because the way that those kinds of prejudices against Jews take place is very similar. There's the sly wink, you know, and the funny little joke that's said sort of privately between people. It's a condescending kind of thing that goes on. You know why Jews have such big noses? Air is free, right? That's actually a really disgusting joke, isn't it? Yeah, but it's typical of that kind of conversation. Same thing goes on about African Americans, those weird little stupid jokes that put people down. So and I'm not talking about being hypersensitive. I'm not especially impressed um, by people who are offended at whatever words come out of somebody else's mouth. I mean, some of us have to grow a backbone and just go through society realizing there are a lot of people who are mean and troubled and will say bad things to us. And I'm not about to let that crush me just because somebody has said something negative about me or my race or my religion or anything like that. In fact, if you're doing that, 
that's really mostly your problem, not mine. And so I'm not going to take it on. Now, this is also not to suggest that Jews have been perfect or sinless and are therefore idealized, innocent victims. All you have to do is read the Bible. <laughs> I mean, if you want to know, did Jews sin? Um, let me think. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't have to go anywhere with that. Um, most Christians have probably never heard of the Jewish holiday of Purim. Uh, let me just turn to where I am here. Okay. In fact, before I go there, let me move forward just a little bit. I'm going to take a very quick trip through history just to do some illustrations of, of time as it moved along. So, well, I guess so I, I didn't turn it on. Now it's on. It'll work. Watch. <laughs> All right, Egypt. So Joseph's brothers, who, who are not really hero material, sell their poor brother. He ends up in Egypt. But then he proves to be so wise and so filled with the wisdom and the spirit of God that he becomes second in command of all of Egypt. And it's his wisdom that saves Egypt from a horrible drought and a famine, right? So Joseph is the big hero, and the result is his family moves, and then a lot of the families related to him, Israelites, if you would, move into Egypt. And they're actually welcomed because they have been so helpful in this difficult time. But 400 years passes, and in that period of time, nobody remembers anymore what it was that Joseph did or how he really saved their crops. And now these foreigners in the land, and they're spoken of that way, are portrayed as a threat, and so they are basically enslaved. They're doing all the dirty work that nobody else wants to do. And to punish them, if they're making bricks, they have to make them without straw. I mean, it's, there's a whole thing going on where the Jews are now in slavery in Egypt. Give me one second. So the result is that God calls on Moses to get them out of there which he does after a fight with the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh, of course, thinks his gods are more powerful than Moses' gods. That's disproven relatively quickly. And so the Pharaoh starts to say, yes, you can go, and then changes his mind. And then finally God says, you're going tonight. Um, don't even bother to cook bread with leaven in it. Just." We heat up the wheat and the flour, or the flour and the water together, gird up your loins, put the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of your house, and wait while the Spirit of God passes over. Firstborn of everything dies except for the Israelites. And so the Pharaoh lets them go. They get to the um, Red Sea or the Reed Sea. And they think they're, first of all, they don't know how they're going to get across. And then they look behind, and the Pharaoh has changed his mind again. He's chasing them. Moses lifts his staff up. Um, you all know Jack Hayford? Yeah, I, he did a really funny version of this. He said, I don't think it was like Charlton Heston, you know, and the sea parts. He says, I think probably what happened was Moses went, and the sea parted, and he went. <laughs> so I think he was as shocked as the people were. And then they go across, and then they wander for 40 years because they're not faithful. So they just keep wandering in the desert. But they get free from the oppression 
that they're experiencing. I'm going to jump a ways from there. Solomon builds the first temple somewhere around 960 BC. Well, here's a quote from Pascal. I should have put it earlier. Men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. Yeah, isn't that right? Pascal was one of the smartest people who ever lived. Great mathematician and a believer. Really good guy. All right. The Jews were exiled into Babylon in 597 BC. Babylon, modern day Iraq. So they get carried away. And in fact, um, if anybody would like to read a really wonderful book, it's called My Father's Paradise. Uh, and it is about um, a young man living in Los Angeles. His father is a university professor. They moved there from Iraq when he was really little, so he has no memories. And his father, Jewish, talks about how wonderful life was in Iraq. And the son can't figure out why he would think that. Uh, and so he goes to Iraq and goes to the village where his father used to live. And the people there remember his father, and they remember his family, and they talk about the friendships that were there between the Jews and the Muslims in all the little villages, and how they traded with each other and shared meals together and cared for each other, until 1948 when Israel became a country. And then the political leadership in Iraq began sending out evangelists, if you would, to talk about how dirty the Jews were and that they needed to be killed or punished. And the result was that the Jews fled rather than be killed. And the local people, some of them bought this story. Others of them went, what are you, crazy? These are our best friends. It's not true. But My Father's Paradise, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. So they get exiled to Babylon, that's Iraq, uh, in 560 BC. And then Jerusalem falls to Nebuchadnezzar, and the temple Solomon built is destroyed, 586 BC. Now that's going to matter for a reason, you'll find out. Cyrus, King Cyrus, allows the Jews to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple in about 539 BC. What's interesting about Cyrus, and we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, uh, is he's actually called Messiah in Scripture. Mashiach in Hebrew. Uh, Cyrus Mashiach. Uh, and that's because of the role that he had in uh, having Jerusalem rebuilt. The second temple which existed at the time of Jesus, had been built and then consecrated in about 516 BC. BCE is the normal academic um, way that it's not before Christ, it's before common era. So what academics do uh, is for what we would call AD, they call it CE, common era. It means from the time of Jesus. I mean, that's what it's about. But in order to make it academic and not religious, they changed the abbreviation. So CE is Common Era, and BCE means before Common Era. All right. So remember the Book of Esther? OK. Queen Esther, secretly a Jew, um, her uncle Mordecai, um, being a Jew who worships only the God of Israel, when the assistant to the king, Haman, uh, walks down the street, he expects everybody to bow to him because of his position. Mordecai doesn't. And so Haman goes in and tells the king, and this is a recurring theme, that there's a group of people living in the kingdom who really are not obedient to the king, and they're troublemakers, and they should be taken care of. Uh, they should be killed. And he gets the king's permission to kill them. Mordecai overhears this, tells Esther. Esther tells the king. It's a way more interesting story than that. 
and ultimately, um, Haman is hanged along with his sons rather than the Jews being killed. That's the book of Esther. And the holiday that it celebrates is called Purim, P-U-R-I-M. That's how you would say it in Israel. The way it's normally said among Ashkenazi Jews, so Eastern European and American is, is Purim. Uh, rather than perim. Uh, and per is basically like dice. You know, if you throw dice or you cast lots, and the plural of it is perim. So what happens is that lots are cast to figure out the days in which all the Jews are going to be killed. So that happens around there, around 475 BCE. Um, so this is celebrated, this is actually one of the Jewish holidays, Purim, uh, and it's celebrated with great um, felicity, with a lot of fun. Uh, and the, probably one of the most fun parts is the whole book of Esther is read. A scroll in Hebrew is Megillah. You've heard the expression, the whole Megillah? Well, what it means is the whole scroll. So at the celebration of Purim, the entire scroll of Esther is read. So they say, yeah, we read the whole Megillah. That's where that expression comes from. So this was an attempt to kill all the Jews in, and, and this province was really the Persian Empire at the time. So it's a huge province. Uh, and it was um, aborted by Queen Esther and her uh, wisdom. So. Now Alexander conquers basically the entire known world. Includes modern day Israel, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, North Africa, Turkey, Greece, Rome, France, Spain. That whole area is conquered and on into India actually is conquered by Alexander. And one of the things that Alexander does is, this is going to sound familiar, he imposes the Greek language and the Greek culture everywhere that he conquers. Okay? And not just a little bit. Alexander's tutor as he was growing up was Aristotle. So if you think about the most famous Greek philosophers, Socrates, they're in this sequence, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and then the pupil of Aristotle was Alexander, who's called Alexander the Great. I don't believe anybody who kills that many people should ever be called great. But Alexander conquers this whole area by the time he's 25, and then he dies. And then the empire is divided up among various generals and relatives and others. But what's happened in the process, and this is, you're going to see where this starts to play out, is the Greek language becomes the language of the entire empire. It's the reason the New Testament is written in Greek, is because of that. Okay? Um, and in fact, it's the reason the Old Testament is written in Greek in a version called the Septuagint. And that, was, that dates to between 200 and 100 BC when the rabbis realized everybody is speaking Greek. Nobody really knows Hebrew. Some people speak Aramaic, but if we're going to teach scripture, we better put it in the language of the people. And so the entire Tanakh, the, what we call the Old Testament, all of it is put into Greek. And that actually is the scripture that was studied primarily at the time of Jesus by Jesus and his disciples. They were studying the only scriptures that existed. There was no New Testament at all, but they were typically studied in Greek. And we actually have evidence of this because some of the quotes that are made by authors of the New Testament, the quote itself is what it says in the Septuagint, but if you compare it to what it says in the Hebrew, it doesn't match. 
And that's because of decisions that were made by the translators that put it into Greek. So we can actually see that underway there. So one of the things that happened after Alexander died and the empire was sort of taken over by various rulers in various parts uh, is that they conquered the temple in Jerusalem. And an awful human being named Antiochus Epiphanes, he was a Seleucid ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth conquered the temple, put an ass's head on the altar in the temple, and renamed it the Temple of Zeus. And threw out the, the Jews and all of the worship that they had had underway, uh, and basically um, desecrated it completely. There arose a group called the Maccabees, um, who were Jewish rebels who couldn't stand the fact that their temple in Jerusalem had been converted into a Greek temple, and the, the Greeks were doing, let's just say, unseemly sexual things inside the temple, and they found this utterly reprehensible, and so they rebelled. Judas Maccabee was the ultimate leader that defeated that empire in Israel and recaptured the temple uh, and consecrated it and restored it to the worship of God rather than Zeus. And one of the things that they found was the menorah in the temple. There's actually a model of it in Jerusalem. It's about this tall about that wide. It's got six major branches and one branch in the center. The branch in the center is called Shemesh, which means servant. It's used to light the other branches. It's not counted as one of the six. So they found that menorah still there, but it only had enough consecrated oil to burn for one day. This is the legend. So they put that oil in it and lit it and then went off to make more consecrated oil, which takes about eight days. And the menorah continued to burn for those eight days until they had new consecrated oil. That's legend. It's not in, in the scriptures. And that miracle is why Hanukkah is called the Festival of Lights because those lights continued to burn for eight days. And Hanukkah, which is a relatively minor Jewish festival around the time of Christmas, does anybody know where in the Bible that the festival of Hanukkah is found? John 10. It's in the New Testament. It's not in the Old Testament at all. It's in John 10, and it says that Jesus was going into Jerusalem for the Feast of the Dedication. Well, that's Hanukkah. The Hanukkah means dedication, and it was the reconsecration of the temple that was being celebrated. Okay. All right, there I told you about the Septuagint being translated into Greek. So Yeshua, Jesus is born we're not sure, somewhere between 6 and 0 BCE, and he was murdered somewhere between 30 and 33. Again, we don't know the exact dates. I know that because of the way the years are counted, it's assumed 0 and 33, but we don't really know for sure, just in that range. Um, and then faith in, well, actually, I need to back up. Antiochus Epiphanes, I want to talk about him for a minute. When he was in charge of that temple, and it was now the temple of Zeus, he required that all of the people uh, there, including all of the Jews, 
participate in parades to Dionysus uh, and that they were strictly forbidden from doing any of their Jewish worship at all. And if they were caught, they were murdered. Uh, and there's even one case of a couple of women who had had their babies circumcised. And so they took the women with the babies at their breasts up on the walls of Jerusalem and just pushed them off to show we don't let Jews do what Jews want to do. There were a group of Jews that were meeting secretly in a cave outside of Jerusalem on Shabbat, on Saturday, to worship. Somebody tattled on them. And so they sent soldiers there. And they wouldn't defend themselves because it was Shabbat. And so they were all slaughtered there. That was before the Maccabees um, recovered it and threw them out. And the, the man who placed all of this horror on the Jews, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, Antiochus was his name. Epiphanes means God with us. And what he basically said was, I'm God, you worship me. Antiochus, I'm God, worship me. Okay? That's where his name came from. When he heard that the Maccabees had defeated all of the local armies there. He was away in Antioch or somewhere like that. He went into a rage uh, and said that he was going to go back to Jerusalem and make it the graveyard of the Jews. He was going to kill every last Jew there. And he got ready to travel when suddenly he was attacked with a horrible disease in his stomach. He was being eaten by worms from the inside out. And his attendants said that he smelled so bad they could not even approach him. He concluded from that that the God of the Jews was the actual real God. He wasn't. The Greek gods weren't. And he wrote a letter of apology to the Jews back in Israel and said, you know, I've always tried to treat you well. Um, and I hereby declare that all of you are free and are to be treated as citizens just like any other Greek citizens, and you are free to worship as you wish. I hope you will think kindly of me. And then he died. Now I'll press forward a little bit. So... Now we have Yeshua comes along. Uh, and, and to be clear, Jesus was a Jew. He lived among Jews. His disciples were Jews. There's some debate, maybe Luke was a Gentile. Uncertain. But clearly, virtually all of his disciples were Jews, if not all of them. And his major following when he was alive were Jews. They were observant. They worshipped the way Jews did at that time. Um, they likely observed the kosher laws. They did the celebrations. They went to temple. Uh, all of those things that a Jew would do in those days, Jesus and his disciples did. Now what happened, and this actually led to a debate uh, and ultimately what's called the Council at Jerusalem, I'm sure you know about, was that Gentiles began hearing about this extraordinary man, or what some said was divine man, that he was healing people and doing other miracles, he was teaching wisdom, he was teaching love and kindness, and there were evangelists. Remember in Matthew 28, Jesus said, Go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, the goys. In other words, go to the goyim, go to the Gentiles and share the gospel. And so they did. And the result was that all across that whole big area that Alexander had conquered, little congregations began appearing 
uh, and ministered to by Paul and Timothy and Barnabas and others. Uh, and congregations began growing up there. Some of those congregations were made up almost entirely of Jews and what I would say Jewish Christians. And they would identify themselves that way. Others were mostly Gentiles and some were mixed. A combination of all of those things. But a couple of things happened that were problematic. Um, one is a fellow named Appian, Greek ancestry, if I remember right, raised in uh, Antioch, wrote a little pamphlet. He wasn't a Christian, didn't have anything to do with the Christians. He just really didn't like Jews. And so Appian rewrote the history of what the Maccabees did in recapturing the temple from the forces of Antiochus, from the Seleucids. And what he said was that the real heroes there were those who had originally gone in and liberated the temple from the Jews and made it the temple of Zeus. And the reason they were the real heroes was because when they got there, they discovered that the Jews had a Gentile man tied up behind the altar, and they were feeding him dainties to fatten him up so they could use his blood in their matzah at Passover. Okay? Appian. You can look it up wrote this little article, spread like wildfire all over the Mediterranean. And it was, people were then going, oh no, these Jews who live among us who aren't like us and have these worship practices, and whether you're a pagan or a Christian or whatever, these Jews now we've learned are eating Gentiles. They're eating Gentiles, uh, or, yeah. So Appian did that. He rewrote the history. This is about 40 uh, common era. So this is maybe less than 10 years after Jesus died. But it doesn't have anything to do, to do with Jesus or his followers. Uh, it's just this guy who really didn't like the Jews writes this. This is the first example of what is today called the blood libel. Anybody heard that term before? Blood libel? Okay. Here's the blood libel. And it actually is spoken today in many parts of the world. It is the accusation that every year an international group of Jewish leaders gets together and decides on a country in which a Gentile baby will be murdered and its blood used in the matzah for Passover that year. And this accusation has been made through the centuries again and again and again. And thousands of Jews have been murdered as a result. see. All right. The temple which had been rebuilt is destroyed by the Romans between 66 and 70. And then in 132 there's a revolt led by a man named Bar Kokhba and he actually throws the Romans out of Israel and establishes a ruling governorship. He's got troops, coinage, governors, he's ruling all of Judea. Uh, and Rabbi Akiva, who is one of the founders of rabbinic Judaism, um, this happened shortly after the destruction of the temple in 70, 
a number of leading Jewish um, teachers were allowed to escape Jerusalem by the Roman commander, and they moved to Yavna, or Jamnia. It's a little city on the Mediterranean Sea, and that city is the origin of modern rabbinic Judaism. That's where it started. They'll tell, rabbinic Jews will tell you that. And Rabbi Akiba was the leading rabbi of the time, still today highly regarded for what he did and for what he wrote and so on. And he declared Bar Kokhba the Messiah. And the reason he said that was, he said, we believe when Messiah comes that he will throw off the oppressors and bring a time of peace to our people. And Bar Kokhba had done exactly that. And so Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, said, this man is our Messiah. Aren't we privileged to be in the generation when Messiah comes? What they hadn't counted on was that Rome had not yet responded. There was chaos in Rome. They were trying to pick a new Caesar. They finally did, and that new Caesar said, what the heck is going on in Judea? And the generals basically said, we got kicked out by this guy, Bar Kokhba. And Caesar said, no. Go take it back, which they did. Uh, and they murdered tens of thousands of Jews in the process, including Bar Kokhba. Akiva survived. And those Jews who survived this massacre spread all over Europe and northern Africa and India and even beyond that. Um, they fled because the, the horror was so great. And the founders of rabbinic Judaism, over the course of the next several years, said to themselves, we've had a lot of people who have been declared or declared themselves Messiah over the last hundred and some odd years. Every time it happens, Jews get killed. This is really stupid for us to keep on doing this. And so they did a couple of things. One of them is they said, we're going to go back to the Hebrew. Instead of reading the Greek, we're going to go back to the Hebrew. And the reason is that the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Hebrew canon, in many places talks about Messiah and implies that it's a person. But a slightly different translation of the same passage could imply that it's either God or Israel rather than a person. And so they realized they could sort of trim down the number of murders that had gone on of Jewish people by not claiming Messiah so quickly. Does that make sense? And so that really is sort of normative among most members of rabbinic Judaism today with the exception of some of the more charismatic and orthodox groups who actually really want Messiah to come now. So the Gentile church grew and it grew increasingly hostile towards Jews and Jewish Christians. And I'm just going to let you read some of this. This is, this is the really hard stuff. Ignatius of Antioch said, those who partake of the Passover are partakers with those who killed Jesus. In other words, if you ever do a Passover in your house, that's what Ignatius thinks of you because you celebrated Passover. The very thing Jesus celebrated the night before he was killed, these Gentile Christian leaders now started saying, whoever does this participates with those who killed Jesus. And you're going to see a list of very famous Christians, people, the saints, people who we regard as saints. And these are their own words. Justin Martyr. The persecution and dispersion of the Jews from Israel was fairness and justice because they had slain the just one. Irenaeus, he was a hero of mine for years. The house of Jacob and the people of Israel are disinherited from the grace of God, have rejected the Son of God, 
slew him. Melito of Sardis, Clement of Alexandria, Hippolytus, Tertullian, Cyprian, Origen, Eusebius, Hilary, Chrysostom, Jerome, Ambrose, some of these have been my heroes, Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Luther. Let me give you some quotes. Here we go. St. John Chrysostom, his name actually means the golden-throated. He was considered an astonishing preacher, highly honored at his time. Here's what he said. The synagogue is not only a brothel and a theater, it is also a den of robbers and a lodging place for wild beasts. Jews are inveterate murderers possessed by the devil. Their debauchery and drunkenness gives them the manners of a pig. That is why I hate Jews. He further claimed that Jews worship Satan and deserve to be hated by Christians. St. Ambrose, another one of my heroes. I mean, literally, I really liked Ambrose until I dug a bit. The Jews are the most worthless of all men. They are lecherous, greedy, rapacious. They are perfidious murderers of Christ. They worship the devil. Their religion is a sickness. The Jews are the odious assassins of Christ. And for killing God, there is no expiation possible, no indulgence or pardon. Christians may never cease vengeance. And the Jew must live in servitude forever. God always hated the Jews. It is essential all Christians hate them. Okay, if you were a Jew in the seventh century in Spain or Portugal and you wanted to convert and become a Christian, here's the vow of faith that you had to say in order to convert. I do here and now renounce every right and observance of the Jewish religion, detesting all its most solemn ceremonies and tenets that in former days I kept and held. In future, I will practice no rite or celebration connected with it, nor any custom of my past error, promising neither to seek it out or perform it. Never again will I fulfill any of the offices of Jewish ceremonies to which I was addicted, nor ever more hold them dear. I altogether deny and reject the errors of the Jewish religion, casting forth whatever conflicts with the Christian faith and affirming that my belief in the Holy Trinity is strong enough to make me live a truly Christian life, shun all intercourse with other Jews, and have the circle of my friends only among honest Christians. Now, the blood libel that I mentioned happened again. Let me show you this. This is a picture of a child being drained of its blood into this bowl. These are the names of the Jews that they were accusing of having done this. And this woodcut was printed, and then the printed copies of it were spread throughout Europe. And the accusation being what I said, that they did this uh, for their matzah. And then when they discovered how much they hated the Jews and they wanted to convert them, what they did was they discovered some Jews, having converted rather than die, were still practicing things like Shabbat, Passover, Purim, Hanukkah, and so on at home. And so they tortured them to get them to admit what they had been doing. And this is actually a picture from the Inquisition, from that period, of the kinds of torture that they did. And I just would point this out. One of them is what today is called waterboarding. What they do is tie you on your back and then 
fill your lungs with water by forcing it down into your body until you're willing to confess uh, or die. Now, the final one that I'm going to share is, is truly the most, well, two of them. Two that are very troubling. troubling. This is a picture from a cathedral in Europe in uh, um, Wittenberg. Uh, remember where Luther nailed the 95 theses on the door? So this is from the corner of a cathedral. And what this is, is it's a picture of a sow. And under the sow are pigs and Jews suckling on the pig. And there's a rabbi here who is lifting up the tail of the sow. And up here it says Shem uh, Hemphorus, which means the secret name of God. And here's what Luther said. Luther described this. Here in Wittenberg, in our parish church, there is a sow carved into the stone under which lie young pigs and Jews who are sucking. Behind the sow stands a rabbi who is lifting up the right leg of the sow, raises it behind the sow, bows down and looks with great effort into the Talmud under the sow as if he wanted to read and see something most difficult and exceptional. No doubt they gained their Shem and for us, the secret name of God from that place. Can you believe how horrible this depiction is? And it's actually on a number of cathedrals throughout Europe. Now, Luther, in his younger years, and this, this will be the last one that I share now, and I'll let you read the rest when you pick this up, if, if you're willing. Um, this, is, this is extremely difficult um, for me, for friends of mine who are Lutherans, uh, and even for other Protestants who have loved Luther, and, and, and the way in which he stood up against a very corrupt hierarchy in the Catholic Church. No question but what he did that. And his protest resulted in what we today call Protestantism or protestism. And in his younger years, was very kindly disposed toward Jews and just believed that by being kind to them, they would eventually experience the love of Christ and they would proclaim him Messiah and Lord and Savior. And he wasn't nearly as successful at doing this as he had hoped that he would be. And so he wrote a 65,000-word book titled, On the Jews and Their Lies. And this book became one of the most quoted texts of Nazism. And here's just a couple of paragraphs of what Luther said. It must dare not be considered a trifling matter, but a most serious one, to seek counsel against this and to save our souls from the Jews, that is, from the devil and from eternal death. My advice, as I said earlier, is, first, that their synagogue should be burned down, that all who are able toss sulfur and pitch. It would be good if someone could also throw in some hellfire. Second, that all their books, their prayer books, their Talmudic writings, also the entire Bible, be taken from them, leaving them not one leaf, that these be preserved for those who may be converted. Third, that they be forbidden on pain of death to praise God, to give thanks, to pray, and to teach publicly among us in our country. Fourth, that they be forbidden to utter the name of God within our hearing. For we cannot, with a good conscience, listen to this or tolerate it. That's Martin Luther. 
Luther's words didn't go unheeded. They were quoted constantly in Nazi propaganda. And after Kristallnacht, remember Kristallnacht, November 9th and 10th, 1938, when some thousand synagogues were burned, 7,000 Jewish businesses destroyed, and 30,000 Jews arrested, German Lutheran Bishop Martin Sassy approvingly wrote, on Luther's birthday, the synagogues are burning in Germany. He told the German people to listen to Luther's words, calling him the greatest anti-Semite of his time, the warner of his people against the Jews. Now, there's more to this, and let me just show you, that's Luther. Two books, you can still buy on the Jews and their lies. Uh, you can buy Mein Kampf, and you can buy a book called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was originally serialized in a Russian magazine in the early uh, 20th century. Those books are the top selling books today in the Middle East. And it's a part of the reason that people who oppose Israel hate the Israelis. And this is a copy of one of those books that's in Arabic. Um, Is it any wonder at all? Since I would tell you that most Jews know this history, they either know it explicitly because they've been taught it or they know it in their guts, that if a kind, hopeful Christian comes up to them and wants to tell them about Jesus, they couldn't be less interested because of all the things that have been done in his name over the course of 2,000 years. I mean, to become a follower of Jesus as a Jew, it's like to betray your entire history and all of your family and everyone else. Now, I know a lot of Jews who are followers of Jesus. I'm one. But the reason is that we've discovered that what he teaches isn't what the church has done. And it isn't what people like those saints said have done. It isn't like what Luther did or encouraged. Somehow or other, they used the religion of the state, if you would, to advance their own devices. And we have to be, as followers of Jesus, of Yeshua, just horrified at what's been done to the Jews, and repentant about it. And without knowing about it, and repenting for what others have done, and maybe what we have done, um, we have no credibility at all. We just don't. And then we really do need to live the love that Jesus proclaimed when he was asked, what is, what's the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets stand under these two commands. That's really what we should be living day to day. And if we truly live that and have that kind of love in our hearts, ultimately, there will be Jewish people who will say, all right, I just found out what a real Christian is like. This I can approve. In spite of all of the things that have been said and done about us, what Jesus says, what he taught, what he demonstrated, it actually makes sense. He really does seem like this could be the true Messiah who brings peace to the world. But boy, we've got to own what it is we've done. Uh, and if we own it, then that honesty, uh, I think, opens hearts. 
Uh, it's, it's necessary anyway, but I think it opens hearts. Any questions? I told you you wouldn't like this. <laughs> Um, typically not. Um, there are places where you can read about anti-Semitism. In fact, you pick this up at the end. I give a number of references that you can go to. Um, but this, this kind of hateful stuff, no, is typically not um, shared with young children. Um, Ever, yes, because it's real history, and they need to realize that they live in a world that really doesn't like them. Um, let me just jump to the end of that. You know that when a Jewish child comes to about the age of somewhere between 11 and 13, they go through either a bar mitzvah for a boy or a bat mitzvah for a girl. Do you know what that expression means? Bar is the Aramaic word for son. Bat is the Aramaic word for daughter. And mitzvah, um, one thing it means is good deed. Some, somebody, if a Jew has done a good deed for somebody and you do one for them, they'll say, thank you, that was a wonderful mitzvah. It was a, it was a good deed. But it also means law. And so the idea is that the law that God gives is not this heavy burden that we carry. It frees us to do good deeds, and it tells us how to do them. And so the same word that means good deed also means law. And so when you become bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, it means I become a son of the law. I take its responsibilities on myself personally. It's no longer my parents that are responsible for me. I'm now responsible. It's a little bit similar to confirmation, except that what the, the boy or the girl is saying is I now accept the law and the, the call to do good deeds as my own. So I become son of the commandments or daughter of the commandments. That's what that expression means. Anybody else questions? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Um, in light of that history, how do you explain the growing number of Messianic congregations in Israel? Um, and we're a part of that movement. Our congregation is. So we actually, when we're in Israel, we worship with them. Uh, and what's happened is they don't deny this, but they say what these people have done is never what Yeshua taught. That wasn't what he told anybody to do. And when we read what it is that he said to do and look at what it was that he did, we say, that looks like Messiah to me. And even if others have used his name as an excuse in their power plays in hurting others, we're not doing that. But we really like what he had to say and what he did and looks like Messiah to us. And, and that's that enthusiasm and insight, and I would say movement of the Holy Spirit in hearts, is happening worldwide. It's really quite something. Back there. When did, originally women were not, or girls were not mitzvahed. It was just, just the boys. When did that start? Well, um, Judaism is broken, modern day Judaism is broken into several major streams. Um, Orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionist, and there's now actually are secular. There are, believe it or not, secular synagogues um, where many of the members are atheists 
but they come together because they're all Jews and atheists. And it gives them a place to hang out with other atheist Jews. So the Orthodox don't do bat mitzvahs for girls. The conservatives now do. The reform do. The restruction, reconstructionists do. I don't think the seculars do that at all because they don't really pay too much attention. And I would say that's been in the last century. The conservatives actually relatively recently. Orthodox still no. Anybody else? Yes. Um, this was ugly. I hear it. I just don't see it. Right here. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> in light of the saints, um, many of them we've read their quotes and have agreed with them on things, not knowing exactly that. Um, and of course, knowing that they are revered, especially in Roman Catholic schools. And are children in Catholic school ever taught some of these things? Never. OK, good. Um, the other question I had about that was, how do we now reconcile ourselves to maybe quoting them? Or you know, do you ever quote them? I, yeah, not lately. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a really serious question. There was, by the way, uh, in October uh, 31st of 2017, the 500th anniversary of uh, the Reformation and of the 95 Theses being nailed to the Wittenberg Gate. There was a celebration of that in Wittenberg. And an important part of that celebration was a common um, repentance of all of those present uh, for all of the horror that had been done to Jews and others uh, as a result of that Reformation. So they were there and did two things. They like, celebrated <laughs> the uh, birth of Protestantism, but they also uh, repented and apologized to the Jews. Anybody else? OK, next week will not be nearly so heavy. There will be a lot of really interesting uh, things about our modern worship and our modern beliefs, um, some of which you will not have heard of at all, and others of which you'll be surprised to learn where they came from and what they mean. And there are also things that, that we missed because we just didn't know and our teachers didn't know when we were growing up in Sunday school, um, which I think you'll find really valuable. Uh, and so it'll be lighter next week. Um, but we really have to face this reality in order to be honest about our faith and about who we are and what we believe. And as I said, there are, um, in fact, you're sitting back by the table. There is a box right by your feet. If you would pull it out and put these things here on the table with the book, these are free. You can still buy a copy of the book and make me rich. Um, but these that are back there are free. You can take one. I've got 60. If we run short, I'll make some more and bring them next week. Anybody else?